Well, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Kelton and Rowan, here for the fourth annual Modern Monetary Conference. We've had a number of great events over the last eight weeks. As Grace said in the chat, we'll be posting all of the previous conference videos to YouTube after we're done here. So if you missed any, you can go back and catch those great conversations. So to um, intro, um, I'm sure everyone is a, a, a familiar with our, our presenters today, but uh, Stephanie Kelton is a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University. She is a regular commentator on national radio and broadcast television, and she consults with policymakers, investment banks, and portfolio managers across the globe. Her research expertise is in Federal Reserve operations, fiscal policy, social security, international finance, and employment policy. And Rowan Gray is a professor of law at Willamette University. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Rowan to get the conversation started. Great, well, thank you very much. And once again, just a huge shout out to all of the organizers, to Hannah and Ashley, Grace, everyone on the team. Uh, this online uh, conference has uh, taken place over eight weeks with over 15 different events. And it's, it's been incredible to watch um, it all come together so smoothly. All the videos will be up afterwards and, and what a perfect way to kick off uh, to conclude the, the conference with a keynote from Dr. Kelton uh, or, or this discussion that we're having to, to sort of break it up a little bit. So I'll have a number of questions as we go along. Uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat and um, we'll either get to them at the end or I'll incorporate some of them as we uh, go along. Uh, but I'll kick us off and you know this is uh, titled MMT, where do we go from here? Uh, so I'll, I'll kick off with a, with a question sort of more specifically to you, Stephanie. Um, there have been a lot of mini arcs in the growth of MMT, often overlapping arcs in different ways. One of these arcs that tells a particular story is your journey from 2015 to today, but beginning when you started serving on the Senate Budget Committee through the Bernie's 2016 and 2020 campaigns through to the Biden transition, the publication of your book, The Deficit Myth, uh, through to the COVID response and, and the influence that you had on the uh, the legislative process and now sort of this writing that you're doing in the inflationary era we find ourselves in. And at each step, the audience reach, you know, public stature that you have, that MMT has, has grown significantly uh, and has the sort of legitimacy and centrality of MMT to the public discourse. You know, once upon a time, we got one New York Times article a year. It was a big deal. Now there's half a dozen before, before uh, May. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what some of you, uh, what you consider to be the, the key pivotal moments in, in that particular part of the MMT journey or that particular arc, sort of how they came about, how you responded, any lessons that you took from others? Because it seems to be a pretty important one in the larger history. Well, sh okay, sure. Gosh, that's a, that's a pretty... Um, sweeping arc that you've um, laid out there, Rowan. And so first, let me just start by saying thank you to you and to the organizers. I wish, and I'm so glad that there is, you know, a, a record of all of the past conversations and presentations that have been part of the fourth annual MMT conference. I wish that we were all doing this together in person the way that we did the first few. Um, and I hope that that will happen again before long. Uh, but I know that, you know, even virtual events are uh, a pretty big undertaking. It takes a lot of people to pull off something like this and those working behind the scenes and, um, you know, volunteering their time and, and to everyone who's made themselves available to be part of this. I'm grateful because I can go back and listen and watch and catch myself up on, you know, uh, what you all have have put together thus far, and I'm just glad to be able to join you here at the very tail end. So, um, gosh, you're right that a lot has happened. And in a lot of ways, it you're I think you're right to sort of start with that phone call that I got from Senator Sanders back in, gosh, 2014. I think it was a couple of weeks before Christmas. And, you know, out of the blue, the phone rang one day and it started a conversation that ultimately led to me taking a leave of absence uh, from the university and moving away from my family and friends uh, in the Midwest and going out to Washington, D.C. to take the job as the chief economist for the Democrats on the U.S. Senate Budget Committee. And uh 
you know, that was definitely one of those moments where when it became public that that this was happening, you know, I can remember the articles, you know, in the Washington Examiner and the Kansas City Star, like there were just a, a lot of articles, Sanders hires deficit owl, like, you know, sort of headlines like that. And people definitely took notice. And I think it um, it was unsettling for a lot of people because they thought, uh oh, here comes MMT to Washington, D.C., potentially to the halls of power where, you know, a, a new way of thinking about some very big and important questions about public money, the way it works, the limitations on government spending and all the rest of it. Um, might well make their way into a place like the U.S. Senate where they could be, a, will say, a disruptive force for good, where, you know, lawmakers could, if they were willing to engage, uh, they they could begin to see the world very differently. And, uh, and I, I certainly hoped that that would be, you know, what happened as a, as a result of me taking a sort of leap of faith in, um, making the decision to go there and and to do that. And I will say that, you know, those early conversations with Senator Sanders, while he never mentioned a presidential run, there was enough out there, you know, you could read about uh, that maybe that might be in the cards. And so I saw that as uh, as an opportunity maybe to be part of something really exciting. And so uh I know there are lots of people over the years who have sort of lamented, uh, I guess, the lack of progress that um, was made in terms of, you know, getting him in particular to do kind of a more full throated embrace of MMT. I don't think that I, I don't think I ever had that in mind that, you know, he would wrap his arms around this completely different way of thinking and embark on a presidential run. It was never realistic. Um, but what I do think is that over the years, what we've seen, and and it has taken a lot of time, and it maybe it sort of started with that 2015 decision, but we've all seen, I think, the the shift in thinking. And you mentioned COVID. And of course, there were um, some early remarks from Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, and even before she was elected, you know, I sat down with her. I think Pavlina sat down with her. Uh, she and I did a Facebook Live event, and we were talking about student debt cancellation. And lo and behold, you know, here we are today uh, with, you know, maybe this administration moving toward doing at least something on that front. So I can't remember every part of your question, because uh, the arc is is so sweeping. But, you know, there there just have been so many moments, the moment with Congressman um, John Yarmouth, the chairman of the House Budget Committee. I think a lot of people probably who are joining today know that he, I think, went further than anyone in Congress ever has in terms of very openly embracing the ideas of MMT. And I and I mean, he gets it. He didn't just sort of understand what it's about. He really took the time to read and to get very conversant to the point uh, of being able to go on television and just hold court for 30 minutes and introduce viewers to MMT in a in a very compelling and sophisticated way. So there's a lot of progress yet to be made, but we've certainly made some good head headway. Yeah, thanks. And I think one thing just to follow up on that is, you know, the way that you tell that story in those different moments, and thank you for mentioning the Ocasio-Cortez meeting, because I think that's also another pivotal moment, is that there are often situations where what you're doing is not, you know, in the job description of an economist academic who writes articles and teaches classes. There's there's something going beyond that. And if you look at the MMT kind of trajectory going back to those early conferences with Warren Mosler or even, you know, the sort of Minsky students in the 80s with Randy and, and others. Um, on one hand, uh, it was good to have, you know, financial support, but there are plenty of groups of scholars that have had financial support. On one hand, it's good to have had a blog early on, but there are plenty of groups that have had blogs. 
And on one hand, it's good to, you know, have some very important insights that the orthodoxy hasn't hasn't covered, but there's plenty of heterodox economists that have those kinds of insights. Um, so I guess, you know, just to think about that story that you we were just talking about in the broader trajectory, the 2025 year trajectory of MMT, what are the, you know, are there any ingredients, any things you think particularly that, that made MMT more successful than, than their brethren, you know, when it comes to heterodox econ or just, you know, trying to have an influence in the public policy debate, you know, you teach, public policy now, your your influence is larger than just one sort of disciplinary stature on that front. I'm just curious if there are any things that you think of that we do things differently and that's why we can sort of explain part of this trajectory. Like the secret sauce of how- Yeah, what, know, why is it that we've somehow managed to get this I moment know. historically? I, I, don't, I don't know, like why did we break through in a way that as you just laid out, others who had, you know, a commitment to, to writing or some financial support or whatever it was, um, what what was it? I I don't I don't know. I do think that saying something that captivates people because it is so different from what they have heard all of their lives and having this sort of you know, motley crew of sorts, right? We didn't come from the Ivies and um, we sort of banded together and amplified one another's voices. There was so much support from within that core group that early, you know, on with Bill Mitchell writing in Australia and with us launching the blog uh, in the U.S. and kind of amplifying. We, I, I know, you know, we would routinely amplify his work. And um, and I think that I've said this before. I think that it was really the financial journalists who took the early interest in our work. And for whatever reason, a handful of them willing to to read what we were writing, to take it seriously and um, and wrestle with their own understanding of how things work and be open to the possibility that maybe they didn't have it all right, you know, in their own in their own heads. And then they started to give us a little bit of a fair hearing and to reference our work. And so but I guess the question is, why didn't that happen for other groups? Why didn't it happen for, let's say, other members of the post Keynesian community? Who... Yeah, there was a there was a conf there was an event we had with Scott Fulweiler, one of our early modern money network events with Dean Baker. And he said, you know, I agree with 90, 98% of what you're all saying. He said, it just sounds like Keynes to me, but I'm not sure if we'll ever get, you know, everyone to read their Keynes, he said. And there was something about, you know, maybe we'll never win that big thing. So I'll just do this other stuff in the meantime. And it seems like something about MMT refusing to lose sight of the big win or something, at least to me, that seems to be a relevant part. I don't know. Yeah. And when I say that excites people, that's kind of what I, I guess I was trying to get at is that there is an appetite for something that goes beyond the sort of you know, at the margins, criticizing and critiquing the system or, uh, you know, we, we could have- fighting a, fighting a little win today that just happened yeah, to come yeah. up and play the next whack-a-mole tomorrow. Yeah, and I think then here along comes this group that tells us we can actually think much bigger and much more boldly and kind of the shackles come off and you're you're liberated in ways that, you know, playing in the in the sandbox of the usual Keynesian like framework doesn't allow you to get super excited about what the future could look like, the possibilities and 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 challenging. You know, people I think they they have this sense that whether they agree with us or not, they have the sense that you know, we're being very honest with them and we're kind of sticking our necks out. We certainly understood that in the early days, my old colleague, um, uh, Bill Black, used to say, used to refer to them as career limiting gestures. You know, when you do something knowing that it's going to limit your career possibilities going forward because you say things about the Federal Reserve and the capacity of monetary policy or you critique things that, you know, uh, 
economists and faculty normally would not say these things. And we, you know, we're willing to, to sort of say things that I think a lot of others aren't and to be more blunt and more honest. And, and I think people re respond well to that. So I want to sort of flip the question and, you know, obviously there's a lot to be, be successful. There's a lot of sort of reflections of big gambles that paid off that I think others have things to learn from, but obviously we're in our own iterative learning process. Are there any moments that really stick out to you, both in your journey and the broad MMT journey that, you know, as you look back with the 2020 benefit of hindsight that could have made a really kind of big, big difference, a positive difference if they'd gone differently, you know, things that we could have actually changed or things that could have, what are the sort of regrettable forks in the road? Any, any that come to mind? Obviously, don't have to sort of spill tea about others, but just we all kind of think back. Oh, if only we'd done something differently here. Or, oh, that was a real missed opportunity. You know, what could have, so what I could have tell, been? I can tell from the question that you actually have uh, something in mind here. I'm curious to know what you. No, I, I, I mean, I have, I have plenty in my own life. <laughs> I'm just curious. This is, the, I'm just curious what yours are. You know, what yours yeah, are about. There are probably dozens or even a hundred uh, such missed opportunities, moments th where things could have gone a little bit differently. Gosh, Ron, like- I'll tell I you one. I remember when I, you called me saying that you were gonna start working for Bernie and I was really busy at law school. And if I wish if I'd just been able to sort of drop other things and know how important it would have been, you know, that's one for me personally, but I'm just curious if there are any now that you've seen so much of the, the MMT arc well, I'm I'm thinking in my head between, you know, policy side and the sort of academic economic side. I, I think that one of the things that I always I think is unfortunate and, and regrettable is just the sort of visions within the academic, broader post Keynesian kind of community and how it would have been so much more useful and not just post Keynesian. I mean, we have had issues uh, over the years with other individuals and I, I'm not gonna say any names, but you no, know, these are people that we had good relations with for a number of years. And then for whatever reason, they started becoming, I get kind of antagonistic and just, you know, I, I think, and I don't understand it. I never have. I. I don't recall ever going out of my way to read something that someone in the post Keynesian community had written and deciding this is the way I'm going to spend my time. I don't agree with everything I just read. So I'm going to spend a lot of time tearing down this other person's work. I just would not uh, ever do that. And I haven't understood why, you know, those relations became so strained with some people with whom we've had very had had good relations for so many years and it would have been nicer to have that community kind of hold together and allow some you know encroachment of new different ideas and maybe not even always new but just sort of rediscovering some of what was in Keynes early on or in you know Lerner or from Minsky or whatever and and allowing some of that to become part of the the broader post Keynesian community or something, but for whatever reason, uh, it didn't happen. And I think it it would we would have been much stronger together. But yeah, I got the feeling sometimes that even when the criticism was never directed at them, just the the critique of how things are done and how it could be done differently that MMT implied almost felt like a personal attack because they're operating in that old you know, paradigm of not asking for more, not asking for bigger, that it, there was always some tension of, of sort of the ambition. Um, but um, to your point, this is, this is a great lead into the next question. Many, many people make the mistake of treating MMT as a, a sort of hedgehoggy school of thought focused on only knowing, you know, one big thing. Oh, MMT is about deficits. MMT is about printing money. MMT, but in reality, MMT is a foxy paradigm. That is to say, it knows lots of little things, or at least a a foxy sort of hedgehog paradigm where you ask one big question, you know, what is money? And then the answer takes you across all these different areas from ancient history to constitutional law, to budget and banking, to labor, to, to price and market theory, you know, in, in different rooms, MMT can be all about the job guarantee or all about the green new deal and others. It's about critiquing orthodoxy and monetary policy and, and all these kinds of things. So 
I guess my question is, you know, are there elements or, or, or dimensions or components of the broader MMT paradigm that you think have been given, you know, have, have received relatively little or inadequate attention in the emerging public narrative about what MMT is? Any in particular, if you could sort of wave a magic wand and increase the volume and, and time that they've been getting in the, in the discourse that is sort of out of our control? Part, yeah, that's the part that's that's tough when you say in the public discourse, because so much of what I think is compelling about MMT. Well, I, I don't even know if I want to say that we've always felt like one of the great strengths has been, you know, demonstrating that we have put forward, I guess, a superior understanding of monetary operations and you know, the mechanics of how things work. And that's very hard to put in front of, you know, a general public and and get people interested. You know, I think it was my first academic publication was all kind of in the weeds on that stuff. And while I think it it is important and it helps to show that we actually can articulate. There's a reason why we say, for example, that um, the funds to pay taxes and buy government bonds comes from the prior act of government spending or lending, right? You have to get the dollars in before you can tax them out or drain them off with uh, bond sales. And that comes from understanding the mechanics. But when, you know, for the, for the lay public, you could just distill that into, you know, taxes don't finance government spending or something. That's a takeaway that people can then come away and and feel empowered in a sense to say governments don't rely on taxpayer money to pay the bills. In fact, they don't even use that, but they don't have to understand all the plumbing. So it's part of the elephant that I think is important, doesn't get a ton of attention, but there's a reason it doesn't. It's, it's complicated stuff. Sorry. Um, you've written everything from, you know, academic books to journal articles to op-eds to doing every kind of media interview under the sun. Um, how have your sort of priorities in, in the output that you produce, the kind of media, the focus of the audiences, how, have that, how would you sort of, looking back, think that's evolved over the years? Are there any sort of huge differences in, in what you spend your time sort of thinking and worrying about when you when you sort of go out there and make an impact on the world, that the way that you're trying to speak, what you're trying to focus on, you know, who's in your head that you're speaking to compared to in the past? So, okay, when it comes to how I spend my time, um, you probably know that I, that I can't say yes. I mean, I can only do a, a fraction of the kind of things that I'm asked to do. And I always try to prioritize students. So a couple of days ago, I got uh, an inquiry from my speaker bureau and they said there, there's a, a high school in Oxford that's doing an event. Um, there's, it's just a pro bono, like they just want you to, to speak at the event. Shall I politely decline? I said, no, you should not politely decline. These are the ones that we always say yes to, right? Because the and I and I told her this is the this is the future. These are the kids. So we always I always do, you know, make time for a student who's working on a project and they're in high school and they're writing some senior paper and they've chosen the job guarantee or MMT or something like that. Can you zoom with me? Can I interview you? Can I? I'll, so students go right to the top of the list always uh, for me, and then mostly, you know, uh, my sifter is, I'm not that interested in preaching to the choir. So I don't really look for uh, podcasts or media opportunities or, or speaking opportunities where I'm going to walk into a super friendly group and lay out MMT or, or whatever. Uh, I don't see a lot of um, purpose, uh, useful purpose in doing that. So I like to walk into the lion's den. I like to go where I think the audience is predisposed to disagree with virtually everything that I understand and, and am going to argue and then put, put the case forward. So I've done a number of 
podcasts with, you know, Bitcoin. I, I got an invitation. We are the largest podcast on Bitcoin. We have more listeners than anyone else. Okay, fine. I did that. Uh, I went on with Anthony Scaramucci a couple of times because I know that I'm going to be reaching audiences who aren't already hearing this kind of stuff. So I like to do that. Uh, and, and can I just like add a for people who may be interested in getting into sort of MMT academic work, scholarship, writing, um, who may not have the, the opportunity to have 25 different, you know, invitations to sift between, but they might not know certain audiences are ones that would be receptive or kind of not intuitively think that's a place that we could, could have an impact. So are there any audiences that you sort of have access to now that you find are sort of very valuable ones that you would not have thought of 15, 20 years ago going into academia, that they might be the kind of people you're speaking to? Um, what do you mean you very can't... valuable? In terms well, just, of... just, just productive, groups that you think are kind of uh, receptive or have an interest or an ability to kind of pick it up because of what they do. For example, I know you've spoken to a lot of financial planners and it seems yeah. like that's a group that cares because they actually have fiduciary responsibilities to people with their money. Um, and I'm not sure, maybe maybe you would have, but I wouldn't have guessed getting into this that that was an audience that would really want to have, you know, an appetite to, to get this right. I'm just curious if there are any yeah, others that come to your definitely mind. Do. No, that's the thing about financial groups. They, you know, it might, it might not sound true, but I believe that it, it, it is. They really don't care about much other than getting it right. So if they think that somebody has a superior framework, understanding of mechanics, if if their belief is in the quantity theory of money, M go up, P go up, you know, and they're placing financial bets with the belief that all they have to do is look at the, you know, M2, and they're going to learn something important about where inflation is headed in the future, or they look at the deficit and they think this is going to uh, necessarily give them insight into where interest rates must move in the future. And they're making, you know, they're taking financial positions and then they're wrong. They want to know how to not be wrong. And so, um, you know, they, they may not agree that, uh, a job guarantee is a, a, a useful stabilizer uh, or, um, you know, support it for social and moral reasons or whatever. But uh, there's enough in there that audiences like that have been super receptive to MMT over the years. And then there are tons of other groups that you wouldn't think maybe would have, you know, much of an interest in understanding core MMT tenants, but they do like, you know, the, the bricklayers union, you know, I speak to a huge group of members or auto executives and engineers. Last year, I went out and did a, a big talk in West Virginia for, you know, these groups, but they understand why it really does matter because, you know, they understand that if the policy response is weak and the economy is weak, then sales are weak and their own industries uh, suffer as a consequence. So whatever gets better public policy in place and a better economy with broader prosperity, people can go out and buy these cars or whatever it is, they're sympathetic to different ways of thinking. They're not dogmatic. And part of that obviously is, as you said, having having something to say that's relevant to either general prosperity or, or issues that particularly affect those groups. So I, I'm curious if there's anything, you know, if you had 10 hungry PhD students saying, give us, you know, topic ideas, you know, where are the places that we can really expand the paradigm, add value, you know, flesh things out further, take ideas and run with them in new context. Are there any things that come to your mind if you had a, 10 clones of yourself to do research in addition to all the other things that you would be trying to to focus on obviously you've got your book coming up but are there, are there other areas that you could see people wanting to get involved to to sort of start digging into sure 10 clones of nathan tankus uh do you know what i mean like 
there, there is obviously a, a, a big need for, I think, more sophisticated work on price theory and pricing, um, inflation management, uh, automatic stabilizers, tax policy. I mean, there's, there are so many areas where if I had 10 PhD students uh, and, a, and a thriving doctoral program, boy, there's more than enough ways for people to contribute to the, um, you know, broader scholarly project uh, around MMT. Your work, I mean, let's be, you know, I will be honest. It took me a little while. I knew that you were right, but I didn't really know why you were right early on because it was years early and you were into this, you know, digital currency. And I kept saying, tip a digital, don't, isn't the dollar a digital? Like I, it took me a little while to understand what you were doing with your own research. And it's, I don't know if you want to say it's MMT, it's MMT adjacent, it's MMT. Yeah, as much as MMT will claim it. Yeah, I, I consider yeah, I it mean, a tradition. I, I, definitely, I definitely will. It, it, I think that fills a huge void. And, you know, because if it's about the monetary system, that the monetary system isn't just this narrow public money reserves and currency sort of, right? I mean, that's, and I understand now, how could you, how could you have missed that when it's the thing that um, policymakers the world over are so focused on right now? It's clearly important. And you have, you know, what, years of scholarship in this area already. So I think that that's not going away. That's another huge area. Um, monetary policy. I don't think monetary policy five years from now is going to look anything like what we have today. Yeah, it's it's you can feel the you can feel it in flux. Um, and and you know to to your credit and to MMT's credit, one of the things that really I appreciated from an early eight days was that it is evolutionary. That there is this sort of in, in integrating of new components, adding. Uh, uh, deepening parts of the paradigm and also looking at what's going on in the world and trying to stay relevant to those issues. So I remember when we were talking about setting up the first MMT conference lineup and you're saying, do you have any ideas for keynotes? And I said, this guy, Brett Scott, has been doing this amazing work around, you know, the war on cash. And you said, oh, I was on a panel with him. Absolutely, let's do it. So even if you hadn't understood it, we were already leaning in and that was 2016 to the fights that are now becoming central because I think part of the skill is always sort of having having your nose to the grindstone or to the to the street and seeing what's coming around the corner. Um, but on that front, you know, one of the notable things I think that's accompanied the growth in, in popularity of MMT has been watching the different sort of layers or faces of MMT gain salience in different contexts and across different audiences, right? For some people, it's sort of found a reception amongst the, the organizing left for some, it's the political and the media elite, you know, the financial journalists, the elected officials, and and in many places, it's all across the academy, different disciplines, law, humanities, accounting, finance, uh, and that's before you get to the business community and and all of that kind of thing. Um, but if you ask about each of them, they might they might not think that MMT is more affiliated with with those other groups than their own. You know, well, MMT is a kind of they're, they're one of us, they're leftists, or they're one of us, they're financial experts or something. Uh, and and it, it gets a little bit disassociative to have these different identities in different rooms that probably can't ever be fully reconciled. So I guess I was just curious if you know you've got any sort of insights or, or reflections on how you've navigated being so many different things to different people and and how that tension sort of plays out in your own you know professional identity or professional action. I mean. Look, I I think I'm a pretty open book. I um, I was Bernie Sanders' chief economist. There, you know, uh, I I hard to hide that, from it, right? <laughs> I wear that very proudly. I am a progressive. I um, I think that anybody who invites me to speak at an event has that in the bio, in the introduction. There's no uh, effort on my part to, to try to duck that. I'm proud of it. I'm proud of the work that I did. I'm proud of him. Um, and so, you know, I, I go in and maybe, you know, of course, 
you you go in to speak in front of an audience and you make emphasize different things in front of different audiences. Um, but you don't, I don't, I don't try to hide anything. I don't pull any punches. I am there. You know, the, the funny thing is I, I mentioned the bricklayers and I mentioned West Virginia. I went, I flew from Chicago to West Virginia and I gave exactly the same set of remarks. I didn't change a word. Uh, I mean, you know, I same slides and whatever comes out of my mouth, but it's basically it was the same talk because they were back to back. And here is one, right, a union group. And I go in and I do my thing in front of the union group. And then two or three days later, I'm in front of auto executives. And I mean, CEOs, CFOs, um, you know, engineers that that was a, a very different audience. I gave exactly the same talk and I got the same reception in both places. Just overwhelmingly positive uh, response from from audiences. So uh, do, do you get any shock of people people thinking I didn't expect to agree so much with a birdie person or you know I didn't expect to find this so insightful. I'm just curious because to me often those are those are spaces where you would think that people would immediately discount one other one. So it's less I was trying to imply that you were being kind of duplicitous more just yeah. th these are spaces where people are not expecting to find any cross pollination. And it happens all the time. So, you know, I was telling Paul, my husband who popped his head in a few minutes ago, um, when I was in Brussels last month, I'm sitting in front of this, you know, huge audience. And we did like a, a little fireside chat. So it's sort of like what we're doing, you know, where I just got questions from a uh, top financial analyst at a uh, major financial institution. And he's asking me these questions and I'm answering and answering. And he, you know, it was clear that he started off with the impression that MMT was this. And then when he got the answers from me, he was learning that he didn't have a very good understanding of what MMT was really about. And so I'm giving him responses. And at one point he said, huh, well, if that's MMT, then I I think I'm in agreement. And I responded by saying, but that's because it's very sensible. And then the audience laughed. And it was just kind of a light moment where, uh, to your point, do people find that they didn't think they were going to end up in agreement? And lo and behold, there's there's a whole lot more there that they find not just acceptable, but it almost becomes, how could we not? be thinking along these lines, you know, uh, why would we not do these things? So yeah, it happens all the time. I mean, and it, it seems to me one of the interesting things about this is there are often contexts where to be effective as a, as a leftist or to be effective with left economic theory, the assumption is that there's only certain audiences that are worth speaking to. But what it seems to me is that part of the strength is by getting if not complete buy-in, you know, grudging respect or validation from the financial journalist community, from, you know, practitioners, et cetera, it's allowed MMT to have a legitimacy that, you know, storming the barricades with a Marxian flag alone would not have ever, you know, gotten to this many people, gotten into this many spaces. So I'm, I'm just curious when you sort of think about the, the, political goals or the goals of actually making the world a better place and sort of the way an intellectual paradigm cuts across different you know, organizing strategies or tactics and things, you know, is there any sense in which you, you have to sort of balance or, or think about, you know, I'm doing this for a reason. I'm getting up every day to make the world better. That's why I'm doing this. And then this is going to take me pretty far out into these spaces to do this, but there's, it all comes back. It all, has a reason, you know. Um, is is there any kind of way that you you approach that, or the others that you know? If you had any advice for people trying to navigate that tension, because I can say from my personal experience, the stuff that I'm doing right now, for example, with digital cash, is forcing me to get into rooms with a lot of companies who are making the technology. Because if we don't have the technology in existence, the public policy can't say we should adopt it. And I thought I'd never be the kind of person to be working with with companies and industry and products, but that's where the work has taken me. And that's what needs to happen to, to have this policy influence. And, 
you know, not not to say that there's shades of gray there, but just that there's a, it, it's hard to explain all of those steps to people on the outside other than just to sort of follow what you're doing. So I'm just curious if there's anything, any thoughts or reflections or you, know, you might have on that kind of dynamic. I just think you have to be willing to say yes a lot. Uh, and to a lot of things that you might not see the value in or the the way that, you know, it's going to position for the next part of the puzzle piece to to fit. Um, but like you saying yes to some of these things, you understand that with the end goal being where it is, you're going to have to pass through some of these other um, go through some of these other motions to get to the ultimate uh, end point. So uh, I think, you know, I, I guess I just try to do that as much as possible. You know, I say yes to groups, not thinking, how is this yes going to help me, you know, but it, it's just sometimes you, you don't see a clear benefit to everything, but just you try to say yes in, in not the usual way. That's the thing. I think that a lot of academics and I understand that they're not comfortable because I try to say, I can't do this interview, but you should call so-and-so or I can give you three names or something. Some people don't want to do press. They're not comfortable talking to um, journalists. They don't want to be on TV or radio. And, um, and I understand that. But it, uh, those are the kinds of things that just help that forward momentum that keep you moving forward. Meet with groups take time out when somebody reaches out and says i'm interested in the work that you do but i don't understand this little part of it if you can respond with an email and some link you know just it, it's over it can be overwhelming and it's exhausting and i understand you know we can't we can't all just be 24 7 pushing forward but i think saying yes to as much as possible I mean, that was something that I noticed very early on was that of this, of all the groups of scholars, I would always get emails back directly. It would always be, yes, how can I help? There was a sense in which, you know, it, be, it movement building begins with that kind of one-on-one -on -one support. But I guess at the same time, you know, there are only so many hours in the day. And I guess part of, you know, prioritization is also saying no or moving on. So I guess one question I had about that is, are there any issues or intellectual arguments that you think MMT is sort of ready to declare victory on or can can turn the page on or maybe can you know doesn't need to devote as much advocacy effort towards as a as a priority versus others are there things that you would sort of rebalance our focus towards now at this stage in the game that might be different from earlier stages well i think it has to be inflation, right? I mean, Warren Mosler used to always say, um, and this goes back 20 some years, you know, Warren would say, once you get them arguing about inflation, you've already won. That was kind of his line. And he would say that because we weren't at the stage where we were arguing about whether something was going to be inflationary or not. We were back in the stage where we were arguing about the impact on the deficit or the debt and the sustainability and tipping points or ratio or, you know, uh, running out of money, turning into Greece, all those sort of things. And now, I mean, you're hard pressed to find even someone at AEI, right, who will push back on the argument that the government can't afford to do X, Y, Z, Medicare, whatever. So, we're at the inflation is the relevant constraint. And I think at least there, it's it's a place I might be comfortable saying, you know, planting a, a, a flag of some kind and saying, you know, we, we seem to have won that part of the debate. But the inflation piece is is obviously where we are today. And there isn't an easy answer to that one. And and that's the next battlefront, I think. And going back to one of your earlier comments, you said one of the strengths of MMT was its sort of operational strengths, the, the, the kind of focus on the financial operations, the sophisticated technical understanding. And I would say, you know, what I, one of the things that myself and Raul Carrillo and others tried to do was bring 
the legal technicalities to the table and add that along with the accounting and, and with the central banking operations and the finance. But I, I was thinking, you know, with your work in the Senate and then with all of this media, I'd say there's another set of layers of technical or operational competency there of how to manage media relationships or what goes on behind the, you know, the doors in, in, you know, in the legislature in Congress. And I just, I'd be curious if, if there are any other sort of technical competencies that we wouldn't think of technical in the same way as we think of accounting, but sort of skill sets that you think you've either picked up or focused on over the years that might be not as obvious to people on the outside, but have proved very important. I'm thinking just for example, you know, you taking a lot of influence from, from George Lakoff's focus on framing and, and how that's clearly been an incredibly important part of how effective you've been in communicating, but just anything else about sort of navigating those spaces and what it means to be, you know, kind of an operations person doing politics or doing public engagement. I mean, I, I think that what the press likes is availability, right? Knowing that there's someone out there who will respond to them and be willing to, to speak, to give a quote. And, and to be able to speak in a way that isn't, you know, trying to show everyone how smart you are all the time. Uh, and, and that I think, you know, some of that comes from a Lakoff, but I violate Lakoff's rules all the time for crying out loud. I titled the first chapter of my book, uh, Don't Think of a Household. And, you know, one of his more well-known books is Don't Think of an Elephant. And he says, the moment I tell you not to think of an elephant, you think of an elephant. So I say, don't think of a household. The moment I tell you not to, you start thinking of a household. So um, I didn't exactly practice what he preaches uh, all the time. And I, you know, tackle the deficit and all the myths. So I'm reinforcing in some ways just by putting the myths out there, but for the purpose of obviously busting them. Um Look, I, if I've had, I won't say if, I guess I've had some success. The success that I've had, I think a lot of it is just down to style of communication, being willing to challenge yourself to write for a, a broad audience and not just aim at your fellow academics in the sort of peer reviewed journal sort of space. But um, it's much harder to do that, to, to write for a broader audience, and at least it is for me. It's it's a it's a real challenge. But I just felt like from the earliest days, you know, launching that blog back in two thousand and nine, that was the goal. I mean, we had the financial crisis and the economic meltdown, and it just there was such a sense of urgency in me to get our voices. And it was a collective effort. It was Matt Forstadter, it was Bill Black, it was Randy Ray. And I mean, these were my colleagues back at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. And I just went to people and said, if I start this blog, will you all contribute and, and write? And, and we can really you know, try to influence and help shape the policy response, right? We can engage in the debates and we can try to have an impact here in our own way. But everyone understood that you have to write in a readable way and um, at the same time, you know, demonstrate that you're sophisticated and compelling. But, you know, that's when the media started to pick it up and, and then that helped. So I, I want to follow up on another part of that in a second. But in the meantime, uh, MMT, I think one of its early strategic successes was going through the internet and bypassing the traditional gatekeepers of particularly the economics discipline where there's sort of five journals that if you don't publish, you don't get to make it and they are extremely ideologically um, exclusionary. Um, and, and today, of course, we've got people writing not just op-eds and books and doing television documentaries and things, but doing educational videos, podcasts, TikToks, etc. Are there any particular forms of kind of media engagement, public engagement that you're more excited about, most excited about in the upcoming years that you found have kind of worked better or, or have more bang for the buck that you, you're you interested in getting in more or, or hoping to see more of? I mean, look, I think that 
I'm getting old and I don't know what Instagram is really. And I don't know how to use it. And I had someone actually ask me earlier today, uh, they were trying to set up Instagram and figure out how to post videos or something. I said, I have absolutely no idea, but I'm sure my 15 year old daughter could hook you up. Like she would know all of that stuff. And almost all of my faith right now is in young people. I mean, that whatever communication platforms they are most reliant on to get their news, to share information, to communicate with one another, then I'm really enthusiastic about that um, because I think, you know, people older than I am have let down generations of Americans and not just Americans, but the world over. Um, so I, I don't know. I Whatever is useful, those TikToks that I've seen that are done by, you know, some who are uh, supportive MMT, hilarious, funny. Um, they, they teach something. I don't know how to do that. I'm old. But people <laughs> I don't are, know how to do it either. Yeah. It's awesome. And if it's Instagram or, or Snap or whatever, I don't know these platforms. I, I know Twitter and and I, and that's all. <laughs> so, you know, but but I love to see the energy. I love the creativity. I used to say years ago, and maybe you remember this. I used to say I wish I had kind of you know uh, some money to work with because I really wanted to do a library of resources. And what I imagined were a series of short videos, you know, seven minute, five to seven minute kind of explainers. And let's just build this library out. I, I would have loved to have done that. But scripting and record, you know, how do you, I don't know how to, I don't have those talents to edit video and all that kind of stuff. But I still think that is an area where um, a lot, that's very shareable content and, you know, somebody with a bit of time and, and some talent could work with some MMT scholars and try to get these little bite size kind of explainers and and others i think are doing things um stephen hale's got a new project out uh with phil lawn and others over in australia um i i think bill mitchell's done something with uh, an mmt kind of teaching tool so people are trying a, a lot of different things and shout out to Hannah Judson and Jessica Burbank for their TikTok videos. Jessica which are great. Burbank, yes, for the TikTok and Anna. Yeah, yeah, and Anna. Uh huh. Um, and I guess on the other side of the spectrum, thinking about young people, um, uh, you know, I, one of the things that I, I liked about Senator Warren talking about personnel is policy. Is when I think about the legal world, there are a lot of issues that to really be successful on, it's not just a matter of changing one policy. It's actually a matter of having people that understand the way that we do things in the right positions, whether that's, you know, regulatory agencies or staff, or, you know, officers in Congress or, you know, entities like the CBO, which you got to see up close and, and came away with a number of thoughts about how to reform. So are there any thoughts or, or suggestions or advice that you can give to younger people who might be interested in trying to, to walk the walk through the halls of power as a way of kind of enacting or helping push you know, MMT ideas into the policy space. Obviously, you, you you were around the senator. You've seen how they build those teams and things. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, there are a number of think tanks in Washington, D.C., and it, it's very clear that um, proximity seems to matter a lot, right? When you have, whether it's CAP or... Um, the Center for American Progress or Washington Center for Equitable Growth or EPI, you know, when you've got staff on the ground and you're spinning out research papers on minimum wage or whatever it is, and you can run somebody up to the hill and, you know, share the latest research findings with staffers who then go to their bosses. And next thing you know, you know, somebody's helping draft legislation. And you know this because you've done uh, a fair bit of this by now. Um, but but the Senate is a weird place and, and the House too, but the Senate especially, I think. And, you know, I remember 
one senator saying to me, you know, the, this is like this place is run by 21 year olds kind of thing. Uh, and it's true, you know, young people have an incredible amount of influence with their members. And if you can become a staffer or become, you know, someone with whom staffers can reach out and, um, you know, get input advice on proposed legislation or something like they've done with you, uh, that's great. It's just an expensive place to live. A lot of internships used to be unpaid. I think that's changed and, and changing, but it's not a cheap thing to do, to take a, a position as an intern, try to work your way up. Um, but they like to bring people out of some of these think tanks, and um, that kind of is a bit of a revolving door um, for some. And they'll do it from Cato or Heritage or AEI or whatever uh, on the other side as well. So policy, research, think tank places, a good possible way to both get involved in the drafting of legislation, working with staffers, becoming a, a staffer. Um, and then, you know, if you're not coming through that. I think it's a lot of it is just who do you know? when a position opens up, you know, the staffers who are already on the inside um, putting forward a name for a vacant spot. And one question building on that, and you know, this isn't a question with an easy answer, so I'm not trying to sort of play any gotcha games, but every intellectual movement has to answer this question of how its members and leaders will eat and pay the bills while they, they do the work that needs to be. So for MMT, like a lot of others, that has obviously involved the combination of external support from, from non-academics, but including, you know, in the early days to an extent, Warren Mosler, and also traditional academic appointments, grants, those kinds of things. Uh, and at least in my limited exposure, relative to other movements and certainly other organizations who are in the same space as we are, MMT has been pretty remarkably underfunded, certainly lacks any sort of central financial puppet master behind the scenes in the, the decade that I've been involved. Um, but it, it, it seems to me that this is a thing that comes up both with, with sort of critic haters wanting to portray this as all in the pocket of, of, you know, Warren's banker money, or on the other side, just the challenge that we face as a movement building pipelines of support. If we lose access to one university's PhD program or one master's program, it's very hard to keep the intellectual pipeline going. Um, do you see any, you know, what what are the kind of biggest hurdles, pitfalls, things that, you know, challenges that you see for the MMT community trying to, to grow and navigate that terrain of needing to sort of be able to, to, to eat, but on the other hand, each one of the ways in which you do that coming with its own strings and with its own challenges and, and pitfalls? I mean, in terms of, you have to be able to recreate, right? So the, take UMKC or any PhD program, but in, in our case with MMT, there aren't a lot of departments where someone can go and get training that will culminate in a PhD where you've got sort of a solid uh, MMT background, right? So, um, Warren tried to do that, I think, you know, in a number of different ways. There was support for the PhD program at the New School for many years. There was support at Cambridge University uh, when Phil Barestis uh, had a, a program kind of going there. And I won't even know there's support in, I think, Switzerland and, and for Bill Mitchell when he was at uh, Newcastle and at UMKC. And I think Warren was really generous. And I, I think he was also, um, at least early on, also trying to, you know, maybe find people at places like Harvard and out where they don't need any money. But, you know, he was trying to create some connections. And, and so um, did it help us? Yes, of course, it helped. It helped to bring, uh, attract faculty, as you got uh, a cluster hire with Matt Forstadter and Randy Ray. Pavlina came, started the graduate program. I came initially on a one-year appointment that then turned into a permanent position there. And then we were able to build something that at its height was just incredible. Um, you know, students from all over the world 
came, we had the largest PhD program, I think, at UMKC. Uh, we had a huge master's program. Um, Levy is now, you know, uh, has introduced a, a master's program, and maybe they will get to the point uh, before long where there's also a PhD there. That's not something that Warren is funding, but you, it does take money, and that is the reality. And especially in a public university like the University of Missouri in Kansas City, we were cash poor, always. Uh, there was no way that a university like that was going to have the, you know, financial wherewithal to bring in, you know, a full professor like Randy Ray and and make these hires and build out this program and provide tuition waivers and and stipends and, and that's what you need to support a PhD program. You got to have money. You have to be able to attract students, and we wanted the very best that we could get, and we got them. And now you have Pavlina and Fadl and Yeva and Drevka and Eric Tamoyne and Jan, uh, and Jan Lang and so, so many others. So um, I, I would never apologize for, you know, having someone like Warren um, come in and say, and he was very hands off, you know, that's what a lot of donors will do. It's not like Florida State Koch brothers come in and say, I'm giving you money, but these, you must do these things. And there are lots of strings attached. Um, Warren wanted us to, to, you know, build something. And he was obviously interested in the Center for Full Employment and Price Stability. Those were broad goals. Heck, those are the Federal Reserve's goals, full employment and price stability. So um, I don't know if that spoke enough to where what you were trying to get at there, but. No, no, I think that was very helpful. I think, you know, from my perspective also, what you were saying about Warren being hands off, you know, there really is a difference between sort of hands off support from people that share common interests and this idea of kind of a donor driven framework. I've seen other groups where you say the wrong thing and you get kicked out and your donor money gets pulled. You know, people very close to us have had been kicked out of, you know, the Roosevelt Institute and things for not towing a party line or the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. Or, um, and then groups like INED and things are, are, are fully kind of pushing influence through the, the weight of the money that they have. And at least from my perspective, the, the MMT community does, does not have a... <laughs> does not have a disciplining rod driven by the money, but somehow has sort of managed to have a very outsized influence. And I think one of the ways that that's happened is through a lot of very um, creative and careful material production. Um, I, I often say to others, it really annoys me that of all the groups out there that make their materials very easily accessible, the Austrian school that loves to talk about scarcity and that there's no such thing as a free lunch goes out of their way to make all of their materials available to everybody um, because that's what you do when you kind of proselytize. And in the early days of MMT, it was sort of possible perhaps to have a single repository of all the scholarship of all of the articles out there or something, you know, approximating a pretty big chunk. But as it keeps growing and becoming more diffuse, I get the worry that there's a lot of people out there spreading you know, mis mischaracterizations of MMT. And then there's a lot of siloed aspects of MMT scholarship that, that isn't coming together. Do you, do you sort of see any particular possibilities, challenges? Are there things that you've thought about on that front? How we, how we keep a coherence to what MMT is in the face of it growing ever larger on one hand, but also ever more people deciding they can talk about what it is and, and, and what, what it means to have some sort of, you know, integrity to the boundary of the, the body of work? No, I think it's too big. I think, I think it's too big. And I don't really want to try to think about electing, you know, gatekeepers, people. I've heard proposals over the years of trying to come up with a way to certify this is MMT certified. Someone has read what this MMT adjacent person is doing or has written. There's some chance that someone will read that and think, oh, that's part of MMT. 
But if it's not sanctioned from on high and someone hasn't signed off on it, then it can't be welcomed into the sort of broader MMT scholarship. I just don't think we can, and I don't think we would want to, I don't want to try to police what others are doing in a way that says, yes, you're in, no, you're out. You know, it's too big. It's it's too big at this point. You've got lots of people who've never had uh, a college course from anybody, you know, who has contributed to the scholarship or could be considered an MMT scholar or, or whatever. Uh, but they're out there writing all kinds of stuff and maybe they're calling it MMT. And who, you know, what are we supposed to do? Go out and chase after everybody who's, who's out there. I just, it, it's, it's gotten too big. I don't think we can do that. Uh, is it a problem? Yes, because someone will read and it happens to me all the time. And I know it happens to you. Someone will quote back something and say, well, this is MMTers want this or MMT says this. They're quoting someone I've never heard of before. But I don't know how to. I, I don't think there's a way to stop that from happening unless you've thought of something I haven't thought of. No, I haven't. And, you know, we th I think about ways in which we can as much as possible, people who do share common values and things to speak with one voice in ways, you know, putting multiple names on on documents and things. But I think you're right. You know, the alternative of kind of a carceral approach or a, or a kind of authoritarian boundary has its own problems that may actually outweigh whatever the problem you're trying to to fix there is. And, and certainly one of the ways that I've tried to deal with this and maybe, you know, curious if you have any thoughts about that is we often talk about what is MMT? Well, on one hand, it's a set of principles. On the other hand, it's a sort of lens or a framework that you can then apply to other issues. Um, and I also say, I think on another level, it's a group of people. It's a sociological thing. It's a, it's a practicing community, just like the law is in one sense, what lawyers do or what people who are involved in the law do. And, um, I think that's the the part where, to me, that that difficult question of what are the boundaries of the ideas bleeds into what is the community we're trying to build. You know, who who is welcome in that community? What are the spaces that that we want to make people feel like you know this this kind of behavior is not acceptable? Not not because it's intellectually problematic, or maybe it may be, but but because we're getting up every day choosing who we want to work with, and it matters you know, to choose people who aren't trying to do things that we don't agree with. Um, so I guess maybe another kind of follow on to that is, uh, do, you, do you see kind of ways in which the MMT community can have a set of values as well as ideas that, that we can commit to? Is there a sense, not, not political in a partisan sense, but in a values sense, way in which you identify you know, who you work with or what you're trying to do. Obviously, I assume you wouldn't be going to Bernie Sanders if you're a Trump supporter or if you kind of, you know, don't, that kind of thing. But are there other, are there other ways in which you see this community having a coherence in its values? On one level, yes. I, but on another level, no, it's too big now, Rowan. It's so, it's so big. And even within the broader MMT, even, even within, I should say, the tighter MMT community, there are um, people who make decisions about how to comport themselves in other groups that I don't, it puts me off, I guess. And I don't think it's helpful to the larger community when you're trying to win hearts and minds and, um, but we share, so, I mean, if we're Venn diagrams, right, we're, we're overlapping 95% of the way, but, but in some important, there are some important value differences in the way we treat other members of the community sometimes that, so, but I don't know, I don't, uh, I don't think we can have there's no MMT code of conduct. There's no MMT value statement that everybody's going to sign on to. And, and we're different. We have differences. Um, I just think it's inevitable. I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm not 
I'm not answering your question. No, I, I think you are. I think I appreciate the honesty. I don't think it's an easy question. I didn't sort of expect to have an answer that would sort oh, of satisfy that. <laughs> no, and, and, and for me at least, you know, coming from the Australian context, we have political parties that have factions that have clearly defined, you know, antagonistic roles, Labour left, Labour right, and things like that. And there's a sense in which you don't consider them part of your same, you know, shared values, but there's also a sense in which there's a larger enemy in, in whatever particular context. And at least to me, that seems to be part of this challenge is trying to work out how many lesser enemies that you would be would be needing to be on the same side within particular rooms or trying to work out which fights matter on a particular day. Um, but I thinking about, yeah. With anyone. Like there's, what is so hard about letting things go when, you know, you're gonna see one of your, you know, someone in the MMT community do something, say something, you think they get it wrong. You think they, you have a choice in that moment, you know, to make a big public spectacle out of it or to just let it go and find something bigger to worry about in your life or to have a private word. I mean, I guess there, there's, those are the three options. And I think you have to understand that, you know, having broad alignment and a shared commitment to trying to, you know, lean in to this effort is a lot. And if you're not there a hundred percent and you're making mistakes 5% of the time, maybe it's not worth, you know, making a big production out of it. Um, but on important things, values, you know, sometimes you have to, right? You, you need an intervention. Sometimes it's worth calling somebody out because it's, it's a real problem. But I think a lot of the time there's just, a lot of pettiness that gets gets in the way and and at least to me there's a difference when we're talking about people who've got personal values and people where those values are actually influencing the direction of the mmt community you know i, I like to say we're the ones if we're the ones turning up and doing the work we're the ones who have a say in where the direction goes and to me there's certain communities certain groups that i want to make sure feel welcomed in this community and if others are not doing that then we have a difference in in direction we want to go and that that is meaningful it, it's meaningful where we choose to you know allocate our resources our time our attention and things like that but again i think your your broader point which is the, the term mmt itself to to be boundary policing that would have a very very uh a large set of secondary implications that go beyond saying well i don't want to work with those people i don't want to be in institutions with those people but to start defining what is an is an MMT in that sense can have a a larger um, a larger kind of castle or authoritarian limiting uh, effect. But on, on this question of kind of priorities, there one of the things that I've experienced and I've been trying to struggle with this is there was a moment at the end of or the beginning I would say of last year where we had come off the back of a fair bit of campaigning around the job guarantee. You know, people even not just Sanders, but others in the presidential campaign were contemplating talking about it. You know, um, Cory Booker had a version of it. Gillibrand was talking about it. Uh, and uh, even people like Hick and Looper were coming out against it. Uh, and then, of course, Biden got in. And even though in many respects, his team, some of his members were were open to other aspects of the MMT sort of framework, that that interest in the job guarantee kind of fell by the wayside. And I remember during COVID and I was focusing on emergency cash relief. I know you were focusing on these big budget questions, trying to keep the door open to, to a larger spending commitment. Uh, and, and Pavlina was out there saying, you know, we need to have a job guarantee in the middle of this. And I know you were saying that as well. Um, but it, it seems like even as we've had success in some areas, there's a there's a sense in which that issue has sort of fallen off or, or is, in a, is in a retreat moment. It, it isn't getting much attention. Do you, do you see any green shoots, any light at the end of the tunnel, any particular you know, openings for that in, in, in any of the work that you're doing, any of the spaces you're in? Is, is it just a sort of sense in which the pendulum has to swing one way before it'll swing back? Or? I mean, I think, and you will know this better than I, um, isn't there some momentum in Australia with 
political parties there embracing and putting this on a, a, a party platform? Um, yeah, so the Labour Party just won there and they've been putting the job guarantee on all of their youth party platforms, a number of state parties. So there's certainly some interest there, that's for sure. And I think among Greens, uh, because I, I do think that it is, it, it does become more difficult in an economic environment in which the unemployment rate is hovering around three and a half percent to get people thinking what we need is a jobs program, right? We have everybody saying, look at the number of vacancies relative to the number of um, people out looking for work. So it's harder in this economic environment where I think it is very much still alive is in you know the, the climate justice sort of movement that people who are thinking about all of the, the work that needs to be done, jobs, things that we have to do and do quickly and do on a massive scale and to have this just transition as part of um, getting you know, global action on climate. Uh, I still hear job guarantee as part of, you know, uh, as part of that messaging and part of that sort of platform, but um, people like Cory Booker, other members of Congress, I think probably much less of a sense of urgency given the economic environment. And I guess that's that's a, a good follow-up question is, do you, you were talking earlier about the fact that MMT for a long time had been orienting its intervention towards a, an environment of low inflation or, or sort of persistent under demand. Uh, and, and now we have to deal with the other side of that, you know, the Warren Mosul, we, we, we've already won kind of, now we have a new problem to win. Um, do you, do you think there's a different set of concerns now compared to, you know, even a few years ago when it comes to the job guarantee advocacy? As you said, we're in low unemployment, but we're also experiencing that kind of uh, uh, run up in inflation before we hit that tight full employment barrier. And people saying, well, you know, we, we haven't got to 2% unemployment, but now we need to start cooling off the economy and that question of kind of unemployment being the lever to do that or the Nairu has come roaring back. Do you do you see a sense in which this is requires a pivot in our focus of job guarantee advocacy or is it just a matter of you know finding different coalitional interests here? Is there any I don't think it requires a pivot. I think that um I don't think that there are I don't think that most people believe that we don't have, quote, tight full employment today. And I don't think that 2% unemployment is what most people, right, uh, are are aiming for when they say, I want a, a tight labor market. I think most people think that what we have at the moment is an extremely tight labor market. And you know, you know this. That's what uh, Chairman Powell sees. That's what the rest of the FOMC sees. That's what most economists probably believe. That's what political pundits and others see. They see number of vacancies here, number of seekers here. Hence, very tight uh, labor market. So I don't think it requires a pivot. I think um, you know we're already talking recession. This is the the word of you know, of, of the moment. Everybody is, is it going to be this year? Is it going to be next year? Is it going to be a deep recession? Is it going to be somehow V-shaped? Is it going to be? Um, you saw, I'm sure, the IMF report that came out, what, a week ago, where you've got the IMF saying, when the next downturn happens, we need to start thinking about how we are going to, how we want policymakers to respond. Remember, you know the report I'm referring to, right? This IMF report that said, we ought to do um, central banks ought to just be the ones sending out the checks next time, you know. Uh, and so that's, again, turning to this sort of I've called it like the money cannon. Right. You you, you just sort of almost indiscriminately, but not quite this. Yeah, you know, I believe it calls it pump priming. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so you, you want to get cash into people's hands and figure out, you know, who doesn't who gets left out, and then you draw the line somewhere, you means test it, you figure out how much to send, and you send a bunch of cash. Um, so that, I think, is itself an opening that keeps the job guarantee as an alternative way to 
you know, have a, a response to a slowing economy, an economic downturn, rising unemployment that's targeted, that's counter cyclical, that doesn't rely on literally an act of Congress to, you know, come back and um, provide stimulus each time that once you get the thing in place, then it is there and the payments uh, will become automatic. And you know how this, uh, people know how this works. So I think it's, uh, it, it's still something that people are, are going to consider if only as an alternative to what others are putting forward. And to the extent that people can sort of look at these things side by side and say one is targeted, one is counter cyclical, one doesn't rely on Congress, the other now would be in the hands of unelected, right, um, technocrats who are figuring out essentially how to run fisc what's a, what amounts to fiscal policy, um, do the means testing without being accountable to voters to figure out who gets and who does. That's, it, I, I welcome that. If, if we can have you know, the job guarantee uh, debated in that context of what, what, how do we want to fortify things going forward you know, because the next downturn will come. And what kind of policy response do we want when it happens? Well, that's also a nice lead in, which is uh, thinking about the different ways to try and influence policy at that federal level, not talking about sort of activism and things. But on one hand, you've got legislation. and I've obviously written some and seen exactly how far you can get with some of that. And on the other, you've got sort of executive action. And there's the whole debate right now with President Biden canceling student debt. And that's a that's a different set of constraints. But I think one thing that comes up a lot in the MMT discourse is straddling that dance between executive you know, action and legislative legitimacy. That on one hand, we want to be making sure that some of this stuff is recaptured by the legislature. We've sort of handed it over too much to certain technocrats who aren't acting in the right set of interests or with the right framework. And, and in, in that context, maybe with monetary policy, taking it back from the agency, the Fed, has a, has a positive social value. But at the same time, and as you've written before, and I think you know history will look at your Financial Times op-ed saying that maybe we need an independent fiscal agency is a very important moment in the MMT you know, development. Um, that there is a sense in which at the same time, some of the criticisms that have come out in recent years have, have been based on this crude misunderstanding that MMT wants to reduce everything to legislative action, like we're gonna have a vote every week in, in Congress about what needs to be done for the next week or something. And so, you know, how, are there any particular places you see those, those two forces that kind of, when do we wanna put it to an administrative agency or to an executive that can operate nimbly versus when are we trying to kind of claim back some of that uh, decision making uh, to to more sort of discursive democratic processes? Um, I don't know. I mean, the executive office has you know fairly broad powers, and I think people like Dave Dayan, right, have um, assembled something like a hundred things that the Biden administration could do through executive action, executive order, executive action that chose to do so. So there's a lot that um, an elected president can initiate through that office. And I'm not sure that I've thought very much about, you know, when to say, well, it would be better to run that through Congress. Obviously, that's a, a part of the debate that's been had over student debt cancellation. Um, but in terms of MMT and, um, you know, elected officials being accountable to voters and saying the way that we currently try to move legislation through Congress and up to the White House is fraught with all kinds of problems and there are these barriers and the Congressional Budget Office and the um, budgeting framework that is in place that has lawmakers vetting proposed new spending for the impacts on the deficit and the debt as opposed to vetting major legislation, not 
you know, we want to do 5 billion on a youth job guarantee program or 500 million or whatever, 25 million here. They're not going to, um, MMT is not there to say, you know, you have to run this all through some special MMT um, budgeting frame. But for major legislation where we can't get things done because the wheels grind to a halt because CBO's score comes back and says, you know, it adds too much to the deficit or the bird rule is violated or whatever the case may be. Um, that's where I want MMT making inroads in in that process. And I guess last question, um, you know, real softball, because I've made so many easy questions, is just uh, the, the title of this talk was where do we go from here? So are there any kind of big picture, last things you'd like to leave the broader community, students, people who might be watching this video in the upcoming months? You know, where, where, where would you like to see MMT go from here? Just anything that we haven't already talked about or just the big takeaways for you when you're kind of thinking about next steps, what would the big win look like at the end of this year or in a few years' time or something like that? I mean, for me, the big win, if we're going to talk about a big win, a big win for me is meaningful action on climate. What, what, else, what else is there that's bigger than that? So, you know, maybe we'll see $10,000 of student debt canceled for a lot of people. That's going to feel like a big win for someone who has exactly ten thousand dollars student loan debt. Um, but the big, the big win for me is it, it, we're so far from where I would like to see us. And so, to the students and to you know everybody else that you just mentioned, uh, we have a lot of work to do and a long way to go. And I know that there are people out there. Andres Bernal is is kind of a tireless, um, you know, force of nature out there working with uh, candidates. And I know that many of you are as well, but finding people who are willing to run for office, which is just one of the hardest things that a person can do, the amount of work that's involved, um, you know, running for office is very, very hard. And he is someone that I know has been working with candidates trying to get them up to speed, um, MMT kind of informed. Uh, we need to see a, a much bigger coalition of people in Congress who you know, can think differently, can remember what it felt like, frankly, in 2020 to pass the CARES Act or to pass the American Rescue Plan Act in March of 2021. I talked with some lawmakers. I talked with some lawmakers who were emotional. I mean, absolutely emotional after passing that legislation because they understood what an incredible impact they were about to have on the lives of millions of people. Remember lifting 40% of all the kids in this country out of poverty with a single provision in that bill, they now know what it feels like to be able to do something like that. And I know a lot of them don't ever want to go back to what it was like in the bad old days when you thought you couldn't afford to do anything, when the deficit had to be the priority and the um, kids and planet and everything else is secondary to concerns about you know, looking after the budget. And I just hope that we can, you know, that this bout of inflation doesn't ultimately, um, you know, lead to the two steps back after the two steps forward, because we had the wind at our backs and, um, and I think we just have to keep pushing. Well, that's a great moment, I think, to end. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you for the frank conversation. I very much appreciate us, you know, being able to talk about what's going on within the community in an in a, in a open way with everybody. And thanks for everybody who's participated and attended the various um, events of this conference. Uh, as Stephanie said, we'll try to make sure to have it in person next time, but it's uh, been a pleasure. Please stay involved. If you want to get further involved with the Modern Money Network, feel free to reach out. Uh, otherwise, uh, see you on the other side. And thanks to everybody.